Well, good morning, Tower View. Good morning, everyone who is watching and listening this morning. Thank you. Um, you may notice things look a little different behind me. Um, I'm trying a new setup, and that requires me to be in a new room. So um, I've had some issues the past couple of weeks with the Wi-Fi, so I am trying not to use the Wi-Fi today and see if that makes things gooder as my grandpa taught me to say. You're not going to argue with my grandpa, are you? Well, thank you uh, for watching. Thank you for listening. Let's see. Well, boom, boom. I'm getting messages here. Um, all right. Um, all right. Yeah, just somebody sent me a message. All right. And I thought it would make sure it's not about the, the, the live stream. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Linda. Good morning, Shirley. I can see my comments this morning, which is one of the things I wanted to do. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're not somebody I just mentioned and you're not somebody that I know, I am Pastor Nelson Nisley, Associate Pastor of Tower View Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. And current temperature in Kansas City, according to National Weather Service, is 33 degrees. The high temperature for today is a 33, predicted high temperature for today is 33 degrees. So it ain't going to get much warmer than it is right now. So that's it. Um, this is a Sunday school lesson. We are going through the book of Luke. Um, if you want to find more out more about us as we go through this Sunday school lesson, you can find out more on our website, towerviewkc.com. If you're watching this live, obviously you found us on Facebook. You can check out more on the Facebook page that is there. So I thank you for all all that you do. Um, let's see, what else? Is there anything else? I think that's the intro stuff that I need to take care of. Um, so I'm in a new location. Do you know where I'm at? Bonus points if you know where I'm at. All right. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God, we just thank you and we praise you for all the blessings that you provide. We thank you for the scripture that you provided for us, Lord, that we can each have our own copy, that we can study it, we can read it on our own. Your Holy Spirit is there to touch our hearts and touch our minds through everything. We just pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So today's lesson, we are in lesson number, in your book, it's lesson number 10. Yes, I am a week off. Um, I decided to not follow the table of contents that was in the lesson plan. And I skipped a week because the text was out of order. So I am a week off. We are in Lesson 10. We are in Luke chapter 5 again. But now we're in verses 17 to 26 in Luke chapter 5. So Lesson 10 is where we are at. I know I am throwing people for all kinds of loops by doing this. And so in some ways I apologize for that. In other ways I don't because... I blame Lifeway for this one. They, put, they didn't put the text in the right order because of other... I know why they did it. I'm, I'm not belly aching about that, but I, I determined that their reason wasn't good enough for me. So we are in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. And one thing as I go through this, I'm going to try to avoid the word story. Okay, I try to do that every week. I don't try to say the word Bible story. Why? Well, that's what we always called them. I know that's what we always called them. They've been called Bible stories since before I've been around. The reason I'm not doing that is because in our culture today, story equals fiction for most people. You don't think of story and mean facts. And so I try not to say Bible story. I say Bible account, you know, things on that nature. So I'm trying not to use the word Bible story because people seem to think that, well, it's a Bible. It's all made up anyways. It was made up by a bunch of religious lunatics. And by the world standards, we are lunatics because um, we don't do all the things the world does. But that doesn't mean the accounts, the descriptions of the events that happen in Scripture are not just mere stories as if you were reading a Harry Potter novel or any other kind of novel. These are true accounts. 
This is nonfiction. These are things that have happened in the history of this world. They are not there just for our entertainment. They are there for our edification, big word. They are there to build us up, to tell us more about God, to tell us more about ourselves, to tell us how we need to live in this life, to tell us about the future life to come, to tell us about a bigger world than what we just see when we look out the windows of our house. It's more than what we see. It's more than what we hear. It's more what we can feel and taste and touch. It's more than this physical world that we are in. And the Bible tells us about that. And it's not fiction. So as we look at this account, as we look at this event in Jesus' life and the life of the, of the others around him, I pray that we can look at it and it will touch us. It'll touch our mind. I keep saying that when I pray. That it'll touch our minds. It'll change how we think. It'll change our emotions about things. It'll touch our soul and change our spirit because do we... God gave us a spirit. We were created in his image, and he gave us a spirit, and it will, that's part of our eternity. And I pray that it will touch that spirit and change it. And because of that, it will change the way you live. It will change what you think. It changes your attitudes. It changes the words you use. It changes the decisions that you make. It may not be drastic decisions. It may not be anything major about quitting your job and going to the ministry, which God may call you to do. It may just be how you treat the, 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 the young lady at the grocery store who checks out your groceries. It may affect how you treat that grumpy old neighbor next door. It may affect you because you're the grumpy old neighbor next door. It may affect how you treat your dog, one of God's creatures. And so I pray that that's what this will do. I pray that it'll touch some part of you. I don't know everybody out there. I don't know what all you're facing this morning, but I pray you know that this will somehow affect your, your life. So as we get started here, I'm going back here and I'm looking through some comments and see who else is in here. We have, uh, um, my mind just went, I'm reading the comments and I can't read them. Uh, John and Hannah. And, and all the girls that are there, good morning. And let's see, Karen, good morning. And so thank you for, for, for leaving the comments and such. I appreciate it. Uh, Shirley's there. That means Don's there. And so I know, I know there's some other people lurking on there. Um, and I, I appreciate each one of you being, being there this morning and, and watching and listening. So let's get started. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. On one of those days, while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, and, all from, and from, also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal him, to heal was in him. And so... As, you, as we read through the book of Luke, we know in the first few chapters here, in verses 4 and 5, that Jesus began his ministry, he has been teaching everywhere he goes. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's teaching outside next to the lake. He's teaching from the lake. So each week he's teaching the synagogue. Here today, in this, in, in this incident, he is teaching in a person's house. We don't know which person's house it is. Is he in, we, we, we know he went to Peter's house earlier in chapter 4. Maybe it's Peter's house again, but it doesn't say that. It could have been Levi's house, who, who, who he's getting ready to call here later in chapter 5. We, we looked at that last week, but we kind of looked at it out of order. We don't know whose house he's in. We don't even know for sure exactly which town he is in at this moment. He's in Galilee. He's around Capernaum. If he's not in Capernaum, he's in a nearby town. And we know that these Pharisees and teachers of the law, that's kind of redundant. It's that kind of saying pastor, and he's a Baptist, and he's a pastor. Um, Pharisees are a, a group of teachers. It's one sect of teaching, kind of like a denomination. It's one school of thought. It could have been that there were Sadducees and scribes of the law. It could have been the Essenes and teachers of the law. Those are other sects that were in 
Israel at this time. You know, if we, you know, teachers of the law, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm, I happen to be a, a Southern Baptist pastor. But there were pastors out there who were Presbyterian, different flavors of Presbyterian, different flavors of Baptist. There are teachers of the law who are uh, from the Assembly of God. There are teachers of the law from many other denominations. And so saying he's a Pharisee is not a title in of itself. It tells you what their thought, how they studied scriptures and how they thought about scriptures. In our vernacular, we would consider them the conservatives. As far as they, they believe the scripture. They believed in angels and demons and heaven and hell. They, they, they believed on it. Some of the Sadducees were more liberal in their theology, and they didn't believe in all that stuff. So we know that there's Pharisees. They believe scripture. And we know some of them are, are teachers of the law. So they would have been called rabbi. They taught at the synagogues. And, and Luke makes a, the last line of this verse, Luke makes a comment. He says, and the Lord's power to heal was with him. Which seems like an odd statement because it's like, well, well duh. In fact, if you just go up a few verses, the paragraph just before this in verses 12 to 16, Jesus healed a leper. He had just healed a man of leprosy. People didn't know how to cure leprosy. There are no leper colonies anymore in the world because we've figured out how to cure leprosy in the last 100 years. 100 years ago, there were still leper colonies. And Jesus healed a leper. And he did not follow CDC guidelines because he touched the leper. You're not supposed to touch a leper. Leper is a contagious disease, and you can get it from touch. And Jesus didn't follow those guidelines. But he healed him. So the guideline didn't have come anymore because he was healed. So we knew that Jesus could heal, but Luke makes this statement here, near just in case you're, you you need that little extra understanding of who Jesus is. So this is the first statement we see in here that tells us who Jesus is. Jesus of Nazareth. He had the power to heal, and it came from God Himself. So they were in this house. He was teaching. There were Pharisees, there were scribes and rabbis in there, probably some of his disciples, the, the called disciples. And then Jesus had other disciples that followed him that, that aren't named. There were more than 12 people who followed him around. It doesn't say who else was all in the house. You can also read an, uh, uh, another description of the same event in, in the book of Mark, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It has a few extra, a few different details. It's like it was the same story was told from another a different person. If you go someplace, and and you know if, if something happens and the police and the, the police have to come interview everybody, everybody has a slightly different story because they were looking at different things. They see different details. They miss different details because where they are in the room. Because what they're paying attention to, what caught their eye. And so it's the same way when you read the four Gospels. You say, well, well, they contradict each other. No, they are four accounts of the same life of Jesus. They're going to see different details. Different details are going to interest them. Luke is a doctor who is writing to a Roman government official. He is going to be looking at different details than Matthew did who was a Jewish man, who was, elite, who was a, a tax collector, a man of means, is going to be different from Mark, who wasn't even there, but heard the account probably from all the events from probably from Peter, versus John, who was one another one of the disciples, who at the time he was a disciple was probably the youngest one, but he lived the longest. And so he's going to tell the account from his point of view. A fisherman who was very young, probably, when he was a disciple. And so we we have all these things. And so they're not contradictory. They're complementary. They're telling you different details from a different point of view. So verse 18, Luke chapter 5, verse 18. Just then, some men came carrying a, on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. 
They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a stretcher through the roof, through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. So we know Jesus can heal, and Jesus is teaching. We don't know what he's teaching. It doesn't say. It's like when he taught by the side of the lake. It doesn't say what he taught. He just said he was teaching. He was teaching these these, uh, rabbis. And while he's teaching, these four men come up carrying a stretcher with a fifth man, and they're trying to get in the house. And this just says here there's a crowd. If you read the, the account in Matthew, in Matthew, in Mark, Mark chapter 2, it says there were people, and there were so many people, they were standing in the doorway and, and, and had their heads dangling in the windows, around the windows. And so here it just says a crowd. So you just you have to picture that, you know, these guys couldn't get in. All these important rabbis were here because those these people saw themselves as very important. They wore special robes all the time to show that they were teachers. They liked their titles that they had that showed deference and showed that they were more important than other people. And so they weren't going to move out of the way for some poor schmuck on a stretcher. Here comes four Bubbas carrying another Bubba on a stretcher. And they weren't going to get out of the way for any of those guys. It's like, no, we're here to, we're here to learn. We have to report back to our supervisors, our, our, our rabbi supervisors back in Jerusalem about what this Jesus is teaching. But these four men are not detoured. They decide to go up on the roof. Now, their roofs aren't like our roofs. We have nice, we have sloped roofs with shingles or slate tiles on them or something. Their roof was useful. Their roof was flat, horizontal flat. And they had to get up on the roof. You didn't need a ladder because you could just take the stairs around the side of the house. The roof was like an extra room to your house. It was like a patio or a deck. You had to go outside and go up, but it was a useful place to do things. So in the evening, you could go up there where it was cooler if it was hot time of day of the year. Um, you could do work outside so you didn't have to do everything inside. They may have, especially in the summertime, probably did their cooking up there so you're not heating up the inside of the house. And so they went up on the roof, which was easy enough to get to. But now if you have a roof that is useful, what does that tell you about the strength of the roof? Of the roof? and the ceiling above the, above the room below it. And it says it was tiled because it, when it did rain, it had to keep the rain out. So it was still waterproof. So to dig a hole in the, in the roof over where Jesus was, was not a trivial action. This was not just some simple thatched roof. This was the floor of the upstairs deck and the roof to the, the, to the house below. And so you're dismantling. So to do this, that means they had to dismantle this dude's house, whoever's house this was. They were vandalizing the house. And this would not have been quick. It doesn't say they had tools. I mean, I can't imagine they come planning to dig a hole in some of these roofs. So I don't know what they used to puncture a hole in the wall, in the ceiling of the, uh, of the roof. And then to make that hole bigger, but that would not have happened quickly. So here's Jesus teaching. These guys are outside, and the people inside, most of them probably didn't even realize anybody was outside. I mean, they knew there were people outside. They didn't know these four Bubbas were come, trying to get in. Maybe people around the door might have known, but they weren't getting out of the way. But all of a sudden, Jesus teaching, all of a sudden, they hear a bunch of noise on the roof, and dust starts falling, and debris starts falling on the head of Jesus and, and, and the, on these rabbis and on the owner of the house and anybody else who was in there. This dust and debris starts falling down. The owner starts yelling, hey, what are you doing to my house? Imagine a look from Jesus or a hand wave. He's like, calm down. It's okay. You know, would it would have stilled him. But still, how long would it take him to dig this hole big enough to put a man through? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, longer? 
would not have been quick. Could you keep? Could Jesus keep teaching while all this dust and debris is falling down on them? Did they make the hole big enough that they could lower this man down horizontally the whole way? Or did they have to tie him to the stretcher so they could lower down vertically and then flip them horizontal as he fell? It doesn't say those kind of details. But Jesus couldn't have been teaching this whole time, but maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Maybe it, was, it became a, a teaching moment to the, to the owner of the house about sacrifice, about God's will in this incident, about faith. And so all this happens, finally, and we get to verse 20. It doesn't say how long time passed to get this hole. But Jesus, seeing their faith, and then they finally lower this guy down, and he lowers them down. And if this room was so crowded, how could you lower a stretcher? Well, as the stretcher's coming down, people finally move out of the way. So either they get more close together, or a few people get pushed out the door. And they lower this stretcher down, and it lays on the floor. And finally, he's laying there on the floor, and it says, Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith. Their faith is a noun. We usually think of faith as an action. But here it's a noun. Seeing their faith. He could see it. It was something tangible. And whose faith is he talking about? The man on the stretcher or the four friends who carried the man on the stretcher? Who had the faith? The man on the stretcher may not have had anything to do. It's like, guys, I don't want to do this. And they said, we're taking you anyways. It doesn't say the background. It doesn't say how this man was paralyzed. It doesn't say how old he is. Was he paralyzed from birth? Was he paralyzed from you know, some accident. I, I remember there, there was a, um, on the Christian uh, TV network I used to watch as a kid, they had, I think it was called Superbook. They had cartoons and they would go back and the kids would get to go back in time and see some of the Bible events. This was one of them they saw. And in, in the Bible event, the, this man on the stretcher was run over by a Roman chariot. And that's why he was paralyzed. But we don't know why this man was paralyzed. It could have been that. It could have been something from birth. Um, he was kicked by a horse. Who knows what happened? But he says, see in their faith. He said, your sins are forgiven. Now think about this. The four men who were just digging the hole, this man here, they, they, and it says Jesus had the power to heal. And all this, all Jesus says is, your sins are forgiven. Now we know eternity, that matters. But they just didn't dig that hole in the roof of this man's house to have his sins forgiven. The homeowner did not put up with the hole being ripped over in his roof just to have Jesus say, your sins are forgiven. That's not what they were there for. They, wouldn't, they, they came because they thought Jesus would heal this man so he could walk again and provide for his family. But Jesus saw this as a teachable moment for something else. So we already had a statement from Luke that said God's power to heal was on Jesus. Now Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And this, to understand this, this is not like me as a pastor saying, Accept Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. Telling you about the forgiveness of God that somebody else is. This is Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven because I say your sins are forgiven. I mean, if I go around saying that, that's a problem. Because I don't have that authority to declare somebody's sins forgiven. And the, scribe, the, the, the scribes, the rabbis, they understood what Jesus said and what he meant. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? I'm going to surprise you. 
they are absolutely correct. These scribes, these rabbis are absolutely correct. Who can forgive but God alone? Only God can forgive sins. And any man who is presumptuous enough to give forgive people of their sins is a blasphemer. So these Pharisees, these scribes, are absolutely correct in their thoughts that no mere mortal can forgive sins, and that is blasphemous to me if they try. These scribes, these rabbis, these Pharisees, they understood the law, and they, they could make judgments based on the law that were binding on people. But they knew they could not forgive sins. That's why you took your sacrifice to the temple. So the problem wasn't their thought here. Their problem was their understanding of who Jesus was, who Jesus is. Verse 22. But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, Wait a minute, perceiving their thoughts? I'm a counselor. I've been I've been got a degree in counseling. If I get to know you and I see your facial expressions, your body language, I might perceive kind of what your mood is maybe. If you're somebody that I know personally, I might perceive some of the things you might be thinking about because I know you've thought about them in the past. But Jesus didn't know these people from the past. These are not friends he grew up with. But he is the son of God. He could perceive their thoughts. As it says in Psalm 139, he knows our thoughts. He knows our words before we say them. So he perceived, he, that means God can perceive our thoughts. And so God the Father can perceive our thoughts. We know that from Scripture. And here's Jesus in the flesh perceiving their thoughts. So once again, we see that Jesus is from God. He is God. He has the power to heal. He has the power to forgive sins. And now he has the power to perceive thoughts that are not even spoken out loud. Jesus replied to them, Why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Well, if we had a church service and there was a group of people there, and I walked up to a person and I said, who's in a wheelchair? I said, your sins are forgiven. Well, that might be blasphemous because I don't have that power. But nobody can really argue with me that says yes they are or no they're not because what is how do you how does your physical appearance change from forgiveness of sins? Some of those, you know, you came to Christ as an adult, there was a very big emotional reaction, a spiritual reaction within you, and you changed, and you there was much about you that changed. And I have met people who after they came to Christ, they were different. They talked differently. They thought differently. But, you know, the facial recognition software isn't going to see anything different from your face on the day before your salvation, the day after your salvation. Your face is the same. You may smile more. Your emotions are going to be different. Your attitudes are going to be different. But physically, you are the same. And so it's easy to say, your sins are forgiven because that's a spiritual thing. But to tell a paralyzed man to get up and walk, that's a completely different thing. There are so-called faith healers out there, but they pick and choose where they do their things. And they only choose to do it in controlled situations in their own services where they control who comes in and who comes up to the preacher. Everything is very controlled. There's nothing random about it. They don't go to the hospitals. They don't go to the homeless shelters to heal people. Jesus is here. He's not a, he, 
He didn't set this up. Here's this man, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And people are going, wait a minute, you can't say that. And they are correct. A mere man cannot say that. But they are not understanding yet who Jesus was. But Jesus, to make his point, to show that who he is, he says, which is easier to say, you are forgiven or to get up and walk? So verse 24, Jesus is still talking. This is Jesus' words. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. To show that he had the power to forgive sins, he healed this man. Now we have doctors, they had doctors in their day, we have doctors in our day, but we don't, they don't heal instantly. If you break your leg, the doctors can set your leg, then you put a cast on it, and it takes many months, many weeks for just the bones to heal. Then once the bones heal, you have to go through physical therapy to get your muscles and tendons to regrow and, and, and to re-strengthen. It takes months and weeks. Alex Smith uh, used to be the quarterback for the Chiefs, broke his leg two years ago. It took him two years of rehabilitation and many surgeries to re until his legs were strong enough that he could play football again at the NFL level. And so he was healed. But in this case, if Jesus healed him, he would have been playing the next week. Jesus didn't need the time. He, it was an act of creation, the same act that happened in Genesis 1. To heal a man who had broken legs to the point that not only could he, that he, legs were healed, they were fully strength, they were fully coordinated, all his balance was back, all his muscle strength was back that he could physically stand up because he, uh, he would have had muscle atrophy. There had been no strength in his muscles because they hadn't been used for years probably. Jesus completely heals everything. The balance centers in his head, in his ears, the muscles and the tendons in his legs that connect to his back and his hips, his knees, his ankles, all that. Plus healing whatever caused the, the paralysis in the begin with. And he did it in an instant. Showing the power of God the power of God's creation, the way he created the world, he just healed this man's legs. And so he told this man, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. Verse 25, immediately he, the man on the stretcher, got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Now think about it. If we get somebody who's saved and we, say, we don't tell them to go home, we say, okay, now you need to you know, come to church. You need to start learning. You need to start reading scripture. You need to come to Sunday school and, and, and listen to these great teachers we have at our church. If you want to say that. No, he said, go home. And he went home glorifying God. And the man did exactly what he was told by Jesus. And so we see in this text... We see in this account, these events, who Jesus Christ is. He is the power to heal, and to heal instantly and completely and wholly. He is the power to forgive sins. And we know this because he has the power to heal. He is the Son of Man. He calls himself the Son of Man. So that's another testimony on who Jesus Christ is. And so if you doubt who Jesus is, who is, he, is he a man or is he a God? Yes. And that's what the script, you know, that's what we have taught down through the history of Christianity. Jesus is 100% deity, 100% God, 100% human man, male. He is a man. If you cut him, he would bleed, and he did bleed on the cross. As a kid, he fell down and scraped his knee, I imagine. He has He's teaching, and we see the power of God through his teaching. We see the power of God through his actions, that we know that he is not only a mere man, but he is also God in the flesh. 
That's what this scripture shows us. It's hard to wrap our mind. How can a mere man also be God? I don't know. It was a miracle in and of itself. And in verse 26, is like the understatement of the century here, of the millennium. Then everyone was astounded, and they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, We have seen incredible things today. Now think about this, church. Those of you who go to Tower View, if Jeff, who's in a wheelchair, suddenly got up and was able to walk, would you just be astounded? If Bob and Kelly were healed and could see perfectly, would you only be astounded? So this is an understatement. The power of God was revealed through this act. Jesus is God. And that's what the scripture shows. These events. Jesus is God. It's not about the forgiveness. It's the forgiveness because it comes from God. It's not about the healing. It's because the healing came from God and was perfect and immediate. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the second person of the Trinity. And because of that, we know, as you, we go through the book of Luke, and we're going to continue through the book of Luke for the uh, month of February, and the next quarter, we continue through the m- book of Luke. So we're going to be going through Luke here for a few more months. We're going to see, because he's the Son of God, that means something when he dies on the cross. Jesus is the Son of God. And this is just one of the examples of that. We, we know the miraculousness of his birth. We already have that point. But these scribes and Pharisees, they weren't there. But now they're here. They're seeing the power of God. And yet many of these, most of these Pharisees are going to reject Jesus, even though they see it. So their damnation is deserved because they see this and they still reject God. But most of the, you know, how many people there that saw and did not reject him? They didn't know what they were supposed to do because Jesus didn't tell them yet. But they knew, it was like, there's something about this man. I need to listen to him. There's something about this man. We need to listen to him today. And we know as we go through here, he preached, you need to repent and follow God. Because Jesus is the only way to salvation. I am not the way to salvation. I can't heal anybody like this. I don't have that power. I do not have the power to forgive sins. I'm a sinner myself. I need my sins forgiven. And so that's what we need to do. We need to repent. You may need to repent for the first time and follow Christ for the rest of your life. You may have been following Christ, but you need to keep still repenting. There are sins in your life that are reoccurring that you need to repent for and change. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for the blessings that you give us. We thank you for all that you provide. You are the mighty God. Thank you for this scripture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I thank you for watching and listening. Once again, I am Pastor uh, Nelson Nisley, Associate Pastor at Tower View Baptist Church. Um, I'm sorry. I just read John and Hannah Rogers' comment. (laughs) I I think somebody uh, used their phone. Um, That's funny. Um, And and so I, I thank you for watching and listening. We are at Tower View Baptist Church, Kansas City, Missouri. If you're in Kansas City, that's the church by the World's a Fun Water Tower. We are here. We have church today at 1030. Um, If you made reservations, you can come inside. Um, Otherwise, we have drive-in church. You come in, pull in the parking lot, and turn your radios to 90.7 FM, and you can listen to the service there.
Uh, the sermon will be streamed live, a sermon only, will be streamed live this morning um, over Facebook and, and our church's website. So I thank you for, for watching and listening. If, if, if you have any questions about this, contact us. You can contact us through our website, towerviewkc.com. There's a place you can send messages to the pastors. Um, you can call us, 816-368-1330. And you can call that number. You can text that number. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, and such, uh, if you go to the website, you can find our email addresses. And so I thank you for watching and listening today. If, if this w was helpful to you, if this was a blessing to you, you think it'd be others, you know, yeah, click that like button, you know, share it on your wall. Let other people see it. Put some good stuff on Facebook. So thank you for watching and listening. I pray that you have a blessed and wonderful day. God bless.